Hi, Mark. Hey, Megan. How are you? I'm pretty well. How are you doing? I'm surviving. <laughs> Just surviving, huh? <laughs> is the is the housing market getting you down? Uh, well, no. I well, well, halfway. I sold out two years ago. And yeah, you were the, one of the uh, the smart people who uh, who got out ahead of the the bust, right? Well, smart or lucky, that's the question. But but I was figuring by about now I'd be ready to get back in. Doesn't look like it. Yeah, I've had the same thing. I'm uh, I'm sort of now in a position where I might think about buying a home because I think I'm going to be in Washington D.C. for the long term. Um, and you know, you talk to all of the real estate agents, and they say, "Oh, prices aren't going down, and it's all fine." And my mother actually used to be a real estate agent. She's just shaking her head because it's so obvious in D.C. that they're still falling. Is the same thing happening out in, in L.A.? I think so. Of course, it's hard to tell because when prices fall, the market freezes. Right. So you've got lots of high-priced houses on the market that haven't sold in two years. Sticky, sticky prices, the bane of economists everywhere. Right. Uh, so it's it's hard to tell, but I think they're I think they're coming down. Um, so what's your I take more on, at, on more at the bottom of the market than at the top so far? Uh, right. I think that's that's true here as well. Here, what you see is people trying to rent things uh, that they can't sell. Although of course right. that just makes it you know a year older and harder to sell next year, but. Um, I think people are, are still somewhat delusional, which I guess flies in the face of my, uh, or, or it seems to many people to fly in the face of my belief that markets are efficient. I think you have something to say about that. Yeah, I, I think I would distinguish between poachable and non-poachable markets. I mean, the stock market, everybody can be crazy, except the one guy who understands that he can sell short, and that will bring things into balance. Right. It's very, very hard to be short housing. And since people are living in their own houses, they're well, I guess free technically to be we are short housing, right? We're paying we're paying the carry to our landlord every month. Right. Yes. You 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 and I are are, are are at least unhedged in the housing market, but it's hard to go any shorter than that, right? I mean, my <laughs> conviction that not only did I want to sell my house, but I wanted to sell your house too, wasn't easy to act on. <laughs> yes, I've so I think those some markets very are pungent words for people who try to borrow their neighbors' houses in order to sell them. I think that's right. So I think those markets. Because they're stickier, uh, are more likely to be inefficient in the sense that you actually could make the right guess. I think I think selling your house when all of the executives of all of the housing uh, home building firms were selling their stock was not a hard guess. And on no, the other hand, I'm... when I got to LA in in '95, and the market had dropped about 30 percent and was now maybe five percent off its off its trough, mm -hmm. it wasn't hard to guess that you should scrape together every nickel you had for a down payment. It yes, I think that, that probably housing markets are much... I mean, and, and this is something that's true. I've been arguing about efficient markets hypothesis uh, on my blog for the last few days, and there's a lot of, I think, misinformation about what the efficient markets hypothesis actually says. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of people who believe that what it means is that the market finds, like, the true best price, which, of course... Right. Um, All it means is you can't beat it on average. Exactly, um, but I mean. So again, I it's not clear to me. Even in the stock market, why couldn't you have beaten the market by going short housing stocks when everybody who was running a home builder was selling? I think it, it goes back to you know the this thing that the market can stay rational longer than you can stay solvent. Part of the information that people want out of the market is if they think it's in a bubble, and I agree that there are bubbles, um, and I think Eugene Fama agrees that there are bubbles. Um, is that you don't know when the bubble is going to end, and that's an important piece of information in and of itself. And your right. guess at when the bubble is going to end is no likely to be better than anyone else's guess. And so right. I knew someone in the stock market who made a killing in 2000 because he was short. Um, he was short all the major indexes. He was short everything. Uh, unfortunately, he almost went bankrupt in 1999 because he had gone short in 97, 98, and 99. Right. Um, and had it not crashed when it did, he would have been wiped out. Right. Um, and I think that was the, the big problem for the housing bubble, is not that people didn't... I, I, I should say, there were clearly, as with any bubble, there were a lot of people, the James Glassmans of the world, who thought that it was actually going up. Right. Um, and I... I mean, yeah, in a world that contains James, James Glassman, why shouldn't it be possible to make money? Um, Buy what he sells, right? Isn't that, isn't that a like, perfect guy? Because you have to be able to guess where the herd's going, right? Then I that, guess. You know... Are you like boy, I, mean, I gotta say, if I could go short American foreign policy, I certainly would today. <laughs> I mean, if they can't find anybody better than James Glassman to sell it, is that amazing? That's the most amazing. I like, 
even I, even I am flabbergasted. Um, I mean, I'm flabbergasted anyway because James Glassman and I are not exactly, uh, um, I guess, kindred spirits <laughs> on the investment front. I, I love Paul Krugman's line about, line about Glassman. You know, there was there was an extra digit in Dow thirty six thousand, and let's just hope <laughs> it was the three and not the zero. <laughs> yes, I think the. Uh, um, it, 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 I, even James Follows, who writes for The Atlantic, which is the magazine I write for, loves, he likes James Glassman as a guy. But even he was like, this is like, you know, deciding to play me as the star forward on the Knicks or something. Right. Just because I really like basketball. Does anybody have any idea what they were thinking? I think uh, my best guess, and I am, uh, I, I'm coming to the sad realization that I'm actually going to have to start paying attention to politics again because no one wants to talk about anything else anymore. Um, but I've been sort of blissfully just ignoring Megan, they never thing. did in Washington. <laughs> it, it, that's true, but it's getting worse even in Washington and also I on see. my blog. No one responds anymore unless I put unless I post something about you know how um, this politician is doing that or whatever. Um, yeah. But I'm sure you found the same thing. Is that it's just that the heightened people are just less and less interested in any topic that is not directly about like who's going to win the horse race. Well, and it's um, you know it's not like on unlike parts of L.A. where nobody's interested in anything but the industry. Right. It's yes. the mistake of having a capital that's just a capital. You know, if the um, capital were Philadelphia or New York, there would be people in it who cared about something other than government. And I think that would probably be good for the government. Yeah, I actually have a surprising group of uh, friends here, not a lot of them, but at least some friends who don't do politics. Um, right. And I'm one of, I'm like, I've been one of them. I do public policy, which is not quite the same thing. Um... But I think that from my limited ex- – and anyway, back to the James Glassman question. I think from my limited exposure to these sorts of questions, the thing is that it's really hard to get anyone to take any position in, in the Bush administration because it's sort of like lashing yourself to the mast of a burning ship. Right. Um, and so they're kind of scraping pretty far down in the barrel for most positions. I mean, Hank Paulson is a welcome ex- exception to that. Um, and whatever you think of the new the new housing plan, I think Hank Paulson has, has been a terrific Treasury Secretary and really, like – um, pretty stunningly good at his job, but he's really been in in the second half of the Bush administration the exception that proves the rule that um, the good people want out as quickly as possible because they don't want the taint of the Bush administration following the uh, the, the malodor following them through the rest of their careers. That would be my guess. I don't know. What I actually thinking. I think Treasury is the one agency that even the Bush vandals have not been able to wreck. I, I don't <laughs> know whether we're ever going to be able to reconstruct justice. I mean, justice was a very High performance, high morale organization when I was there, and for a long time after, and it's it's hurting for certain. Uh, and I think it's um, a lot of places in town. Well, I, th- I think you have to give the Bush administration credit for trying with Paul O'Neill, but uh, I agree. Treasury seems to be. Uh, I, I had a great conference call with them yesterday, where it was a little weird. I was the only person who dialed into the conference call, <laughs> so I suddenly I had like five. Oh, wow. High-level Treasury Secretary officials just sitting there telling me about the about the housing market. Right. Um, but uh, anyway, back to uh, back to efficient markets and uh, and housing. Um, so why didn't you short Toll Brothers, or did you? I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. I'm mean, partly for the reason you mentioned, partly because though it's quite possible that somebody was smarter than the stock market, I certainly wasn't. Um, now I didn't pretend to understand how that thing worked. Um, I'm pretty skeptical that anyone is smarter than the, house, and then the stock market, but I'm very sure that I am not smarter than the stock market. Right, and I'm right. very sure that the huge numbers of people I know, I don't even know is a strong word, the huge number of people I hear about who like to pick stocks um, and or like to pick, um, they like to pick mutual funds and they like to right. pour, it's like this sort of, religious ritual, right? They like to pour over the, the annual reports and so forth. But they don't know how to read a balance sheet. Right. Um, and they don't know how to run a regression. And they don't really have the underlying data um, on these places. And they like to do it anyway. And I, I've had angry conversations with people where they're like, but I, you know, this is important to me. And I really, I enjoy this. It's like, but it's costing you money. It's a really expensive habit. Couldn't you right. just take up fishing? Or, right. No, it's, um, look, it's, it's gambling. It's, exactly. And a lot of it's compulsive gambling. And and it's, it's, I've always found it striking that when we discuss gambling policy, nobody picks up on Tom Schelling's comment from 30 years ago that the largest gambling enterprise in the world is New York Stock Exchange. 
Uh, and because people aren't aware that they're gambling, they do themselves a lot of damage. Well, this gives the gambling gives me a, a lead into something I really want to get you on the subject on because every time I talk to you, you're you're brilliant, and I learn something fascinating, um, which is crime um, and gambling. It. What should what should our gambling starting with gambling? What should our gambling policy be? Well, given opinion. the existence of financial markets, it's pretty hard to control compulsive gambling. They say I think the you know the, the video poker machines are a tiny part of the problem. Um, when I was growing up, my father had a good friend who was a who was a druggist, um, who was a horse player, and had you know, lost a fair fair amount of money in his marriage on betting on horses. So they finally persuaded him to stop betting on horses, and he became a stockbroker. <laughs> And so, I, mean, I don't think there's any doubt that the very short-term payoff um, uh, poker machines and you know their video machines, the video lottery and so on, which I think somebody quite accurately compared to crack in terms of the very tight coupling between the action and the reward. Um, I think that's probably likely to generate more psychological problems than anything that's slower, even the daily number. Um, and do you so think I think that there is a... Sorry. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. But uh, do you think that that's true of? I mean, I'm I'm kind of um, I, when I graduated from business school and I was freelancing. I one of the things that I did was I transcribed earnings reports, and so I got to actually listen to this guy from Harrah's, who is for business school students a fascinating. He was a Harvard Business School professor, and he became the president of Harrah's, and he runs it like a business school case. You read everything that he does, and it really just sounds like a marketing case study. Mm -hmm. um, and so I actually listened to him on the phone talking about the stuff that they do uh, to um, to encourage what they call their avid gamblers, um, which is another that word is a, for addict. people who are about to lose their houses. Um, right. And so he goes through all of these these things, and a lot of them I think sound a lot like what you're talking about. They're these sort of, sort of quick instant rewards right. um, for gambling. And like you know, you if if you gamble a certain amount on a night, I'm gonna hand you a coupon immediately to go get some dinner or see a show. Or, um, and I remember sitting through this call and thinking, and I I don't think that gambling should be illegal, um, actually, but nonetheless, even I was sitting in this call thinking, and everyone's asking all these questions about you know forward earnings, et cetera, et cetera, and the loyalty program, and no one asked the obvious question, which was to me, like, how do you wake up in the morning and look at yourself in the mirror and think, right. my job is to separate uh, as many people from as much of their hard-earned money uh, for as little effort as possible, and to get well. as many people who actually have trouble with this in trouble as possible in order to keep them going back to my casino. Well, presumably, um, if he'd had any uh, had any morals, he wouldn't have gone to work and lost wages in, in the first place. <laughs> um, th 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 this is this is actually a, a quite general problem. Any activity that generates a compulsive pattern, gambling, drinking, use of other drugs, um, is going to be subject to a very strong version of Pareto's law, where most of the activity is in people who shouldn't be doing it. So in the in the drinking case, half of the alcohol that gets sold in the U.S. is sold to people who drink four or more drinks a day on average year-round. Wow. And we're talking about serious problem drinkers. That's half of the booze. And, and the next 30% is people who average between two and four drinks a day year-round. So about 80% 80, 80 of their business is people who are drinking too much. And they say they're in favor of responsible drinking. They must mean that they're in favor of going bankrupt. Uh, which is why I'm against legalizing any more drugs, even pot. I let people grow their own pot. Mm -hmm. But I really don't want to see what anheuser Bush can do with a drug that's more fun than beer. Because do you think it's anheuser in the vice Bush, business, though? Hmm? I mean, do you think that anheuser Bush has a significant effect on, uh, on how much people consume? Um, I mean, like... I it, it doesn't I, seem. I mean, most of the people I know, they may drink. They, uh, very few people voluntarily drink Anheuser Busch products, except in the insofar as they're cheap. But um, you know, like people I know who drink Hendrix gin, they really like Hendrix gin, and it's expensive, and they spend a lot of money on it. But they wouldn't drink less gin if Hendrix weren't around. Uh, you know, bringing this this suave gin brand to them, they drink gin because they enjoy the sensation, the taste of the gin, and the sensation that the the gin produces in them. Right, but remember. Most of those people 
Right? I mean, so you got to distinguish between the typical drinker who drinks less than a drink a day and the typical drink that goes to somebody who drinks four or more drinks a day. Right. I mean, look, there are a lot of very smart people who work for the booze industry and the tobacco industry and the gambling industry. And they certainly know, since I do, that their business is creating, maintaining, and serving addiction. And I assume they know how to do their job. And that if they weren't doing their job, there'd be somewhat less addiction. Um, I guess I'm saying, I, I think that there would probably, like, if, if we all had to brew, um, I mean, even the heavy drinkers or drug users that I've, I, I know or have known in my past, if, if uh, they had to go out in their backyard, grow the grapes, and then brew their own booze, probably they would drink less. Right. Um, just because it's, you know, efficiencies of scale, lower cost. I, I think there was an, wasn't there an interesting study that showed that actually, like, alcoholics are the most responsive to changes in price and changes in the price of alcohol. Sure, which is not surprising because um, it's so much of their budget. Right. So that they will actually preemptively, if you if you announce like three months from now that you're going to raise the price of cigarettes or raise the price of alcohol, the social drinkers and the social smokers don't really do much. Um, but alcoholics and heavy smokers will actually try to quit in advance of that because it's so much of their budget. Um, um. I, I so know that hypothesis that, around. I'm, I'm, I mean, that's the that's the Becker Murphy Grossman right. hypothesis. I'm not persuaded by their methods, but but it's certainly the case whether or not they're foresighted about it. They're certainly price responsive because they have to be, and therefore the fact that the beer industry makes beer extremely cheap matters. Uh, but I think that it also I would matters say is that probably they, true. That having having in the same way that having a business that makes food affordable and easy to get. Uh, it makes us fatter. Right. Um, but, but also the, like, the branding, I think the branding matters. I think if people, I mean, we know that, you know, all mass market American beers taste alike because that's what the companies are trying to do. At the same time, they're trying to do product differentiation through marketing. And I think that if people weren't consuming an image as well as the beer, they'd consume less beer. Uh, I think Knowing that you're a Coors fan or a Budweiser fan or a Miller fan matters to people, uh, even if they can't tell one from another. Um, so yeah, I think the marketing effort probably matters. I'm not not sure how much it matters now. I mean, alcohol is pretty well established, um, but I do think if you got a, a new vice on the market, um, the marketing effort would matter for it. Um, and as we've seen with the state lotteries, uh, and so I'm mostly against it. Um, in the gambling case, I know what I'd do if I were in charge of preventing compulsive gambling in casinos or in the, the, uh, the state lotteries. I'd simply require everybody who wants to gamble to sign up and establish a limit. If people didn't lose any more in Las Vegas than they went there intending to lose, the problem would be much smaller. And the problem is somebody gets on a roll is $1,000 behind and doubles up to try and get back to even. Right. And that you could prevent if you wanted to, but obviously neither the casinos nor the state gaming commissions want to prevent compulsive gambling because that's what builds those fancy buildings. I have to say I was once in Har- I once I was in the position of having lost my credit cards in New Orleans and having to uh, – the credit card company FedExed me a, a credit card, but the debit company wouldn't. And so I had to go through the procedure that they, they make you go through in order to get cash out of an ATM uh, in a casino. Which oh, my was God. The thing. I didn't have the PIN number for the thing. Uh, right. I needed walking around money. It was the most humiliating thing I've ever been through. I certainly, like, I can't imagine that anyone who actually has a compulsive gambling program problem manages to live through it because it's so – everyone stares at you, and they, they repeatedly ask you whether you have a gambling problem and if you've considered going to Gamblers Anonymous. I didn't – you know, I wanted money to go to Jazz Fest and buy oyster – you know, oyster shells and patties. And, right. Um, but – so I guess my question then is what, why shouldn't we – why shouldn't we bring back prohibition? Um, oh, for alcohol? I mean, yeah. Well, if, if, if – I mean, alcohol is by far, right, the worst offending drug in America – um, oh, in terms of volume of damage, for... sure. What? In terms of volume of damage, sure. Yeah. Not even close. Um, is it, like, what, what are, I mean, like, because, you know, the, you always get these comparisons, and, and for 
uh, viewers who don't know, Mark is uh, an expert in drug policy, um, and uh, so which is why I'm 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 dwelling and asking him all these questions. Um, what are the worst drugs in terms of like if you had to rank order, you know, best to worst drugs out there of the common ones? Um, well, again, what are the least the, the, what are the, the least harmful? You've got to distinguish between the harm per user and the total harm. So alcohol is probably not the nastiest drug in the world, but it does by far the most damage because so much of it is used. Right. Um, I'd rank you pretty far up, actually, on the nasty drug list. Um, it's not easy to make the list because there, there are so many dimensions. right? So legality, illegality is an important dimension. If you use an illegal drug, all sorts of bad things happen. Right. Because you're but just in terms of the drug itself... You know what, what the the not obviously alcohol is going to show up as being terribly harmful because it's legal. Uh, ditto smoking is going to cause a lot of cancer because it's legal to use. Um, but apart from the the legality illegality of it, what are just the th- the substances? I mean, if we're thinking about like rank ordering, which drugs should be legal, which shouldn't, which if any should be legal. Right. Um, well, what, there are at least what, at least three dimensions you want to worry about, right? So there's Sheer toxicity, right? The, the drug that's most likely to kill you if you use it is nicotine in the form of cigarettes. Half the people who smoke are going to die early of smoking. And smoking basically doubles your mortality at any age. A really scary number. But that's all it's going to do to you. It's going to make you sick, you know, give you lung disease and so on, and quite possibly kill you. But it's not going to wreck your life otherwise. Right? There's nobody you know of whom the first thing you'd say about him to somebody that you were telling about that person is, oh, he's a smoker. But there are several people you know where one of the first things you can say is, oh, he's got a drinking problem. Yes, that's true. Right? So, so nicotine's the most physically destructive because we take it in the form of cigarettes. If people smoke pipes, we much less so. Um, in terms of bizarre and dangerous behavior, alcohol is probably the winner. Um, alcohol is the one drug which, in the laboratory, you can show generates aggression. It's actually not true of cocaine in the laboratory. I think really? the reason the reason cocaine generates so much aggression is that people take it with alcohol, and the two molecules together in the bloodstream call, form a molecule called cocaethylene, and that does generate a lot of violence. Um, and so people talk about the drugs you know, one by one, which is a little bit artificial. Mm-hmm. Um, so, in terms of bizarre behavior, alcohol and the stimulants compete, but they also combine with each other. So, it's hard to talk about them separately. So, that would be amphetamines and... Amphetamines uh, and cocaine. Cocaine. And it's, it's pretty clearly true that people who get in trouble with those drugs get in trouble more quickly than on true... Is, average on, is true on average for alcohol. So if you look at the typical career life course of an alcoholic, there were a couple of years, maybe several years, of controlled non-problem drinking before you started seeing alcohol abuse. Mm-hmm. You don't get usually that much time lag for cocaine or the amphetamines, particularly in smoked form or injected form, um, though the, the, the instant addiction story is nonsense. But it's, it's clearly a faster addiction. On the other hand... Heroin, which doesn't generate much... Oh, and, the, and both cocaine and the amphetamines are terribly toxic. Um, I mean, somebody who's been a long-term methamphet- heavy methamphetamine user probably has some cognitive impairments that are never going to go away. I mean, he's really actually lost some brain cells. Mm-hmm. Um, it's also true of alcohol if you drink an awful lot of it. Uh, but you have but, to drink an awful lot of it for an awful long time for that to be true, right? Uh, not so clear. Um, There's some evidence that it's really the size of the biggest binge rather than the frequency that mostly correlates with with uh, uh, cognitive loss. But, uh, you know, oddly uh, NIAAA is much less National Institute on on Alcoholism and Alcohol Abuse uh, is much less aggressive about proving that alcohol is bad for you than the National Institute on Drug Abuse is interested in proving that cannabis, for example, is bad for you. So we don't I don't think we understand that as well. Um, but no, there's no doubt that the, the uh, particularly uh, methamphetamine um, has some pretty serious uh, cognitive losses and other kinds of toxicity. I mean, they're just, they're really tough on the body. 
And for a long time, many of us thought, well, the good news is that they're so tough on the body that nobody can do these things for a long time. Uh, and that turns out not to be right. I mean, a lot of us thought, you know, crack addiction was going to be something people went through for five years. Mm-hmm. And it looks like 11 is closer to the median. Um, really? But none of that competes with heroin. If you take a, if you take a, a population of seriously down and out heroin users, for, for example, from the criminal justice population, um, and look at them 40 years later, more of them are going to be dead than off heroin. Uh, there's a very famous study by Doug Anglin and his colleagues at UCLA looking at a group that was in the California Civil Addict Commitment Program, basically a, a drug treatment prison back in the 1960s. And because of a, of a ambiguity in the law, some of the judges that sent people away failed to touch second base. So there were a whole bunch of people who were sent to this thing and cut loose by the appeals court a couple of months later. And there were essentially identical people who judges signed the right order and therefore were in the in the center for like three years. Mm-hmm. And Doug Anglin figured out, wait a second, we've got an experiment here. And has been following those two groups, the people who got kicked out at random, the people who had to stay in at random, for I think the last paper is a 42-year follow-up. And the first couple of papers were really encouraging. You saw big differences between the experimental group and the control group, even three or five years out in terms of the level of addiction. And then you see the 10-year follow-up paper and the lines start to come together, and after 15 years you can't tell the difference. So in terms of sheer persistence in misery, um, heroin's probably the worst. Um, it, you know, it does generate a lot of bizarre behavior. It's not especially toxic for you. It w- wouldn't be especially toxic for you if you were taking it under legal circumstances. Um, but heroin addiction is such a misery. I, I that's find what it bizarre because the, 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 I, the first time I ever saw someone who was taking heroin, they basically showed up at my house, sat down and vomited, and then went to sleep. And I thought, that's not a drug I'd ever like to try. And uh, since then, when I've taken opiates, they make me terribly sick. Um, I've, I've taken them only legally as prescribed for, for pain um, and only been prescribed them a couple times. I can't imagine the attraction of, of uh, sleeping and, and vomiting. Um, well, so a couple things. One is that people differ a lot in their response to opiates. Anything with fur like stimulants. Very few human beings don't respond positively to amphetamine or cocaine or caffeine. Mm-hmm. Um the opiates are different. Only about 25% of the population actually enjoys the opiates as opposed to getting pain relief from them. Um, the vomiting tends to be a result of injection rather than taking it orally. Um, it was, for me, it was just taking, you know, I got prescribed Vicodin when I had my wisdom teeth out. It was just like, I threw up at the, I, I showed up at the doctor's office and immediately threw up. I thought, huh. oh, I remember, this is what opiates look like. Right, right. Um, <laughs> That's not all that common. Um, but it's true that most of the people who have been using heroin for a long time aren't getting much joy out of it. All it's doing is staving off withdrawal. Um, I mean, whoever constructed the myth of Tantalus actually must have met an addict. Because that's the addicted life. You're surrounded with water and you can't ever get a drink. Um, we talked to long-term heroin addicts. And they all say the same thing. Oh, the, you know, the heroin on the streets today is just terrible. You know, when, I, when I was young, the dealers would give you good stuff, and now it's all garbage. Now, we know, in fact, that the potency of street heroin in the U.S. is up a factor of 10 over the last 20 years. Now, what's changed is their neurons. Um, wow. they, they, they'll never have that first experience again, but they'll change it forever. So the, the, the opiates are a, really are a special class. And that's the reason that for a long time people identified drug addiction with heroin addiction. And so cocaine didn't look like an addictive drug because there wasn't a marked withdrawal syndrome. So it turns out drugs that affect the brain are not a single category. Right. And they, they're dangerous on many different dimensions. So it's hard to do a, a, clear, uh, a clear gradient. I mean, I would... Look, I would tend to rate, rate cannabis and hallucinogens as much less dangerous, on average, 
than alcohol, uh, the opiates, and the stimulants. What about something like ecstasy? Ecstasy is an interesting problem. So the early work on ecstasy says, oh, this is a non-addictive drug uh, because it's got this fairly rapid tolerance buildup. Very, very unusual pattern of tolerance. Most drugs will form a tolerance. That is to say, you're not going to get the same effect tomorrow as you got today. Right. Um, and if you've been using it for a while, you're going to have to up your dose to get the same effect. Right. So that's the usual tolerance pattern. In the ecstasy case, it turns out the tolerance goes not with you know, heavy, frequent use. It goes with cumulative life, lifetime use. So that most people who've had six doses in a lifetime won't react as strongly to the next dose as they reacted to the first dose. And that doesn't seem to change either with time or with abstinence. And it's not dose reversible, right? If, you know, once you build up a, a tolerance for alcohol, that is say, learn to hold your liquor, you can still get stinking drunk, you just have to drink more. Right. Once you've sort of burned out your ecstasy circuits, whatever they are, increasing the dose won't do much good. Um, so the good news was supposed to be, hey, here's a non-abusable drug. Uh, all the bad news, it, it turns out that people learn how to abuse it, particularly in the rave setting, the all-night dance setting where the sheer stimulant effect that doesn't form a tolerance is still valued. So a lot of the people who are using lots and lots and lots of ecstasy three nights a weekend and doing themselves, I think, some, some real damage aren't much getting the effect they used to get from ecstasy. Um, uh, in appropriate doses in appropriate settings and in infrequent use, um, it's an astonishingly reinforcing drug uh, probably with some large potential benefits. And that the tragedy with MDMA is that it was converted from a potentially useful drug for therapy or self-examination into just one more party drug. Um, hmm. So it's, it's very risky to people who, for whatever reason, really want to escape from their lives. Um, for most MDMA users, the risks are negligible. So back to back to the question: If, if alcohol is high on the list of nasty substances, um, would you agree that prohibition was pretty much a radical failure? Um, if you stress the pretty much, so what you see in the data from prohibition is a pretty big drop in drinking and in deaths from cirrhosis, which is a good measure of continued heavy drinking by long-term heavy drinkers. Mm -hmm. Cirrhosis deaths went down something like a half in the early years of Prohibition compared to the pre-World War I era. Well, it's not a small change. Right. Of course, we weren't counting things like domestic violence back then. And one of the main reasons that the temperance movement was largely women was there was a perceived connection, I bet it was a real connection, between alcohol and domestic violence. Um, so, I think prohibition suppressed drinking in lots of the country and probably suppressed the consequences of drinking. Um, didn't work nearly as well as the, in the big cities where people were writing about it. And so, prohibition from New York's perspective was not very effective because any New Yorker could get a drink. Um, right. From the perspective of rural Kansas, it probably worked reasonably well. Um, it worked decreasingly well over time. Uh, it was poorly enforced and corruptly enforced. And so the availability of alcohol rose and its price fell throughout the Prohibition era. So by the time Prohibition was buried, the body was already dead and stinking. Um, so now I would it, make the same argument about our drug policies. That I mean, I, as I think you've blocked, the, the street price of cocaine has been falling steadily for... Uh, um, for years. I mean, it's still higher than... I, I can't remember. I Someone I talked to was doing actual uh, lab work with cocaine and, like, rats at Columbia. And he said it was either... The, the, the lab price of the stuff, when you're legally allowed to order, order it from the government, I've, I don't know. It was either $10 a gram or $10 That's, an ounce sounds too, too no, low. No, $10 a gram is about right. Um, um, the and, street price is, is $100. Course, Right, so it's about it's about ten. The street price is still ten, you know, ten times what the 
the lab prices, but that the street price has been falling steadily basically since we started get in keeping the numbers. Well, um, the street price collapsed in the early 80s and has continued to drift down. Um, so given that, given that the, you know, that the, first of all, you've got um, a huge crime associated with the fact that there is an illegal drug trade. Right. Um, and given that um, the street price keeps falling and that it's getting less and less, uh, prohibition seems to be getting less and less effective over time because criminals spend a lot of time figuring out how to get around the law. Um, why should why why should we keep pro, uh, prohibiting drugs if we don't seem to be doing a very good job of actually stopping them from reaching people? I mean, even in like my mother is from a small town in western New York, and uh, even they have now curfews and and hall passes and so forth because of the drug problems there, mm-hmm. um, which definitely wasn't true twenty or thirty years ago. Right. Well, so a couple of couple of things. A factor of 10 difference in price in a drug whose consumption is, it seems to be at least unit elastic, is not a small impact on the size of the drug problem. Um, I mean, the reason not to legalize cocaine as we legalized alcohol is we might as ha- have as many cocaine addicts as we have alcohol addicts. We now have a couple of million people in the country who are in trouble with cocaine at any one time. Probably got 15 million in trouble with alcohol. That's a big difference. And there's a there's a belief out there that you know anybody who's going to be addicted is going to be addicted to something and it doesn't matter what. I'm sure that's not true. You could never be addicted to opiates. I could never be addicted to stimulants. Um, the more no, I've drugs never are been addicted around, to opiates if they keep making me throw up. <laughs> huh? Right. Exactly. I have very strong feelings about things right. that make me throw up. Right. So, but so the mo- more drugs there, that are that are easily available and socially acceptable, the more likely any one person is to find the drug that's going to be his problem. Um, and so I don't think the number of addicts is at all a social invariant. I think it probably matters how many drugs are, are available and how available they are and at what price. So okay, cocaine, co- prohibited cocaine is much more expensive than legal cocaine would be. And it's much more available. Um, look, you live in New York. I live in Los Angeles. Neither of, neither of us, I assume, travels in very druggy circles. Um, I could get alcohol starting right now in five minutes. Presumably, I could get cocaine if I really worked for it, but I wouldn't know where to start. Right? Could you buy cocaine today if I asked you? Uh, I'm trying to think. On the six degrees of separation, I would, right? Right, I but you know, be... if if you drink, you don't have to worry about six degrees of separation. You go yes. to the liquor store. So I um, think I think the effective price of cocaine. Right, the dollar price plus the inconvenience of finding it is high enough that it, it undoubtedly matters. Um, so the question I asked both with cocaine, well, I, I asked opposite questions with cocaine and alcohol. In the alcohol case, all right, we made it legal, good for us. Are we having fun yet? What can we do now that we've avoided the uh, submachine gun problem with alcohol? How can we avoid the alcohol abuse problem and the crime problem, and the drunken, drunken driving problem, and the hate crime problem, and the domestic violence problem. I mean, you look at things that are called hate crimes, about 90% of, percent of them are committed drunk. I mean, really, tipping over tombstones is just not that much fun if you're sober. Um, so, I mean, what I'd say about alcohol is, let's get the price back up. Uh, we should have taxes that double the price of alcohol. Now it costs about a dollar a drink, it ought to cost about two dollars a drink. Um, uh, alcohol is at least unit elastic it's more elastic than that among kids and among alcoholics so those are two good things Um, and people who drink and drive or drink and beat people up should lose their license to drink everybody should have to be carded and if you aren't eligible to drink that should be obvious from the face of your driver's license in California one of the ways they control underage drinking is if you get a driver's license and you're not 21, your picture is in profile rather than full face. So the bartender can look at your driver's license and not even have to do the arithmetic Mm -hmm. to know that you're not eligible to drink. Okay, so you got convicted of drunken driving. We're eventually going to give you your driver's license back because otherwise you can't get to work. But you should get it back with a picture in profile and then you can't buy a drink. And I think people are going to be less willing 
to buy a drink for somebody who's lost his drinking license for beating somebody up than they are to buy a drink for somebody who's 20. So I'd get rid of the age restriction, I'd add a bad conduct restriction, and I'd push up the price. So why not side. do something like that? For, because my argument, like, I, 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 I want to say I agree with you that I think that the argument that no one, if we legalize drugs, no one extra would do drugs, that's silly. I mean, if you reduce the cost of something, more people will do it. Right. Um, you know, we might quibble about how many more people would do it, because in my experience, like, the people I know who have developed serious problems with either alcohol um, or any sort of drug are the people that I would have picked out, like, in junior high as, as being the people who were going to develop these problems. Well, I, the, um, the, the science does not support that. I mean, maybe you're smarter than the average psychologist. But George Valiant actually did a cohort study. Um, so he had data on people in college back when people didn't drink a lot in college. Um, and followed them forward for 40 years. And discovered that the alcoholics certainly had the classic alcoholic personality profile. But what is that? Look, Just a, um, a, a, a um, I'm not sure I can describe it precisely. Um, there's a kind of magical thinking that goes with it. I mean, the, 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 the a, a line is that insanity consists on continuing to do the same thing and expecting to get a different result. Uh, and that's certainly a characteristic of alcoholic thinking. Um, anyway, there's a, there was described in the literature the alcoholic personality, mm -hmm. and it was believed that it was people with the alcoholic personality that became alcoholics. But what you saw in the cohort study was not right. The alcoholic personality is what happens to people who have a long-term alcohol problem. If you look at them beforehand, you can't pick them out from the group. Hmm. So, look, studies aren't perfect. And maybe you're right, but I think it's probably the case that there's a lot of variance and that people who grow up in less alcoholic environments are less likely to become alcoholic. Oh, no, I think that's true. I, I think more that, like, the people that, they, they would have been among the code. They're, they're people who sort of, like, were prone to things like depression and, and things where you would, you knew young that you know, they were, they might want to medicate that, however... Um, or they, they tended to bounce off the walls a lot and need right. to like medicate that down or, um, but, but I agree with you that it would increase my, my thing would be just weighing the social costs of the prohibition. So why not then say, have the government be in the business of, of, uh, um, if not actually just, you know, distributing cocaine then, uh, and, and setting up these licenses where you can't get cocaine if you've, if you've operated machinery under the influence or, or what have you, or beat someone, beating someone up while taking it, um, you know, taxing the hell out of it, raising the price back up, but taking away all of these social costs of having enormous, um, having enormous numbers of criminal enterprises that basically get, you know, spend a lot of time committing violence that wrecks not just their lives. I mean, it entices poor, right, it entices poor kids into this industry yeah. that for most of them is just a lottery they're going to lose and they're going to end up living at home with their mothers and in jail. Right. Um, and has huge social, social costs in terms of the violence and what the effects that it has on already struggling poor neighborhoods. Um, I think there's, I think uh, David Boyum has made this argument that um, cocaine prohibition is a good deal for the middle class and a rotten deal for the underclass. That the, the neighborhoods that are taking the most damage are the neighborhoods where people are being least protected from the problem because, of course, the cocaine is available there. And the cost you'd see would be in much more prosperous places. And I think that's, that's a legitimate thing to say. Um, when I look at the state lotteries, I'm not thrilled with the notion of a public monopoly on cocaine distribution. It, it might be made to work. Um, if it's sold at a sufficiently high price, of course, you'd simply get the illicit market again. So you couldn't have a illicit price that was higher than the illicit price. Um, and my sense is if you had it at the same price but lower social stigma and easier availability, you'd still get substantially more abuse. So I'd like to work that problem from the other end and say, how could we reduce the social cost of prohibition? And there I think we've got some fairly easy answers that we're simply not pursuing. Um, such as? 
such as breaking up street markets uh, using low risk crackdowns. Right? So this is the High Point North Carolina approach where you identify the dealers in a street market, uh, make cases against all of them, and then call them all together for a meeting and say, hi, fellas. You know, here's the felony case against each one of you. Here's the videotape. When you see yourself committing a felony, please raise your hand. Now, we've got lots of social services available for those who want them, but the market's closed. Any of you who even smell dealing goes away to prison. We don't have to buy from you again because we already bought from you. Um, if you do that to all the dealers at once, there's suddenly no market there. And anybody who tries to set up shops stands up like a sore thumb and gets arrested. Uh, so that was tried, and they basically broke up a 20-year-old market with five arrests. Um, the heavy cocaine users mostly have to commit crimes they get arrested for to support their habits. I mean, there are people who are rock stars or hedge fund managers or crooked lobbyists who can support their cocaine habit with more or less legal money, at least money they don't get arrested for. Mm -hmm. But most heavy cocaine users wind up stealing or dealing or hooking. Um, so if you simply shut down on cocaine use among the criminal justice population, which you can do with frequent drug tests and a couple of days in jail every time they're dirty, it's being demonstrated in Hawaii right now, um, you can greatly shrink the cocaine market and the crime associated with it um, without putting a lot of people in prison. And then I'd cut back radically on the sentences. I'd focus the tough sentences on people using violence or corruption or using kids as apprentice dealers or dealing in a way that disrupts a neighborhood. In New York, when the cops cracked down on street dealing, the dealers got cell phones. And apparently what you do in New York if you want cocaine or heroin is you call your dealer and 30 minutes later a pizza delivery truck shows up at your door. So for the established users, the drugs are no less available than they used to be. But the market, imp uh, the neighborhood impact is greatly diminished. Right. So we could have today's size cocaine problem minus some criminal justice folks who wouldn't be allowed to use anymore. Um, and much this less actually brings me violence. to it, because we should probably like move on and uh, and and. Yeah, we're not we're not arguing enough. <laughs> no, we're not. Um, but no, no, I was just thinking yeah. like a, a broader question. Something that I've noticed is that crime isn't really an issue in this election. You know, I, I saw something yesterday about uh, the Politico got a leaked document that said Obama used to be against the death penalty. Um, which, you know, from my point of view, is a feature, not a bug, but I think most of the American public still disagrees with me. Um, but what's fascinating to me is that this really, you know, what I really thought in the end was who's going to care? This is just crime, which I, you know, for certainly through the 96 election was this hugely salient issue, has just kind of disappeared from people's radar as something that certainly at the national level they're particularly interested in. I mean, would you agree with that? I think that's right. I mean, not surprising, crime's down close to 50%. Right. Um, I think that was actually an issue on which, in some ways, the public was closer to being right than the academic and political elite. Uh, crime was a huge issue. Um, and I'm sad we solved it in a fairly stupid and brutal way. But that was probably better than not solving it. Um, do you think that we did solve it or that it was just abortion or demographics or one of these other solutions, these passive solutions that have been offered? Yeah, I, I think the abortion evidence is only so-so. The lead evidence is actually pretty strong. I think probably the biggest anti-crime measure of the last half century was getting lead out of gasoline. Uh, the, the impact of, of lead on intelligence um, is very strong. Hmm. Um, I mean, you probably have a five or seven point IQ edge over me simply because you're younger. Uh, I wonder if that explains some of the Flynn effect. Um, it certainly explains some of the recent change in, in measured cognitive performance, but the Flynn effect goes back to 1850. I mean, I think Flynn is right. It's, it's essentially the, the uh, intellectual stimulus provided by the environment. Um, much more than... Well, it's certainly... Nutrition and environmental protection, including from things like lead, matter. Um, but I think there are other things than that. Lead also has direct effects on behavior, uh, increases impulsivity, and so on. So 
If you looked at lead, you'd say, oh, this is a heavily criminogenic substance, and we've really gotten rid of it. Um, I think smarter law enforcement accounted for some of the drop. I think just more law enforcement accounted for some of the drop. Um, there are heavy positive feedbacks built into this uh, because as crime goes down, the pressure on the remaining criminals goes up. So there are now three times as many burglars in prison as there were in 1980. And there are half as many burglaries, which means the average burglary now costs you six times as many days behind bars as it did in 1980. Now, if people are at all price responsive, that ought to matter. Um, so I think it's a, it's a complex of things that happened. Um, but yeah, since almost all the public it. discourse about crime was stupid um, and in favor of nasty, unproductive policies, mm. I'm happy that it's not salient. Same thing with drugs. Uh, you know, psychotherapy neglect is, is probably a good approach both to drugs and crime at the moment. Um, the professionals seems... in, the, in the crime business are getting smarter, uh, and probably the less jostling they get from the politicians, the better. It, it, it seems that the uh, in the case of drugs, it's really just been uh, replaced by immigration, so I'm not sure. <laughs> no, that's um, right. That's right. I mean, the, the, the social critics who talk about moral panics are clearly, I mean, they're clearly on to something. Um, though having identified something as a moral panic doesn't mean it's not a real problem. Um, yeah, I, I guess immigration so, so is the new crime. Dragging it back to the election, because we know that's what sells, uh, uh, Giuliani is probably going to, you know, one of the things I'm sure we're going to see in the campaign is him taking credit, uh, we already have really, right. for uh, New York's amazing time, uh, crime drop. Um, we, we, what's your take on that? Did I mean, and really, Bill, you know, many people would argue it's Bill Bratton and, and Giuliani just sort of ran in front of the camera as uh, Bill Bratton was pulling well, off a major success. But what do you think? Is that. Far be it for me to say anything nice about Rudy Giuliani, who's the most dangerous candidate for president of my lifetime, and I lived through Nixon. Um, but, you know, Bratton didn't, did, didn't appear out of nowhere. Uh, Giuliani picked Bratton, and Bratton was a non obvious choice. Um, and, and do you think really Bratton really made the difference that he claims? He made a difference. Oh, I mean, there's no doubt. There's no doubt. I mean, yes, crime dropped everywhere in the 90s, but it dropped further and faster and for longer. I mean, crime is down in New York every quarter since Bill Bratton took over as police commissioner. And he made a lot of institutional change that's still there. The Comstat system is a really good idea. And... Uh, it's an interesting question to how many other public services we could apply it. Um, you need need good outcome measures, and you need outcome measures that are quickly responsive. So No Child Left Behind is sort of anti comp stat, and it's exactly the wrong way to measure and reward progress because it's too slow. But if you wanted to do comp stat for education, you'd give every kid a laptop and have computer scored exercises every day so that the principal could call the third grade teacher and say, what's happening to Johnny Smith's reading scores? You know, they've plateaued for the last two months. What are you doing about that? Um, as opposed to getting an average statistic for the classroom at the end of the year. I mean, that does no good at all. Has anyone even tried that kind of approach? I think there have been some experiments. I mean, this is education is not my business. I think there have been some some experimental uh, studies on that um, that, sh that show progress. Um, there's also the whole classroom discipline problem, which turns out to yield to fairly straightforward interventions. Um, uh, and there's some experimental work going on in that. But if, well, one if thing education were, were, as, were as progressively managed as policing, all the reading scores in the country would be a grade higher. One thing that's heavily in the news right now that uh, I think is technically still your provenance is the D.C. gun ban, which, of course, is like particular salience here because um, I'm now living in D.C., and it does have higher crime than right. uh, than New York did, uh, which kind of surprised me, I think. You know, it's smaller, and certainly my mother just moved down, and she's shocked at the level of crime here. Um, <laughs> so now, of course, the D.C. gun ban comes along and is, uh, has got everyone up in arms. Um, 
And you've actually uh, you're 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 an interesting case for me because you're you're definitely liberal, um, and as far as I know, don't shoot guns or. Um, but you a couple years ago wrote a great post, basically saying that the the evidence really seems to be a wash. Um, the the freely available guns seem to neither increase nor decrease crime. Uh, freely available guns in the hands of people who aren't criminals neither increase nor decrease, decrease crime. Um, Keeping guns out of the hands of criminals is a worthwhile thing to do and right. hard. Um, and but I harder think even... because they're so available to everybody else. Um, if we could have a British or German or, or Australian level of private gun ownership, we'd have less homicide in this country. Um, I mean, the U.S. no longer leads the world in crime. For most crimes, uh, Western Europe is substantially worse than we are. It's gone from half our level to twice our level since 1970. Does anyone have a good theory of why that is? Um, six of them. <laughs> Not many good, as far as I can tell. Um, but we still, we're still the world leaders in homicide, right? We're still the world leaders in homicide because we're carrying all these deadly weapons. I mean, things that used to be fistfights are now murders. Um, and in Europe, they're still fistfights. Uh... Guns We've had the guns for two centuries. Uh, Michael Bleal having been pretty much uh, ripped down. We've always had. Um, well, we've always, you know, always, why always had a lot of rifles, mm-hmm. uh, but rifles don't kill that many people. Um, uh, poor criminally active kids having handguns is relatively new, right? I mean, as late as the '60s, there were zip guns that is say homemade gun substitutes for kids who couldn't afford guns. The crack market took care of that. They provided both the money and the motivation for lots of kids to, to arm. And of course, once your playmates were armed, you, well, you better be armed. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, keeping guns away from criminals is a good objective. And there's some things you could do about that. Um, keeping guns away from ordinary citizens is of no particular significance. It'll cut down on homicide, right, if that were your concern, but it's not mine. Um, so I would pro- propose a grand bargain on guns where the the gun fans get what's called shell issue so that if you want a pe- permit to carry a concealed weapon um, and you meet the qualifications, you have no criminal history and you went through a short training course it must be issued to you it's not discretionary in the local police chief Right. that's what the pro-gun people want I'd give them that, I'd give them the right to carry interstate if you've got a license in Georgia, you should, you should be able to take your weapon to Nebraska. Um, and in return for that, I'd want a more aggressive gun tracing system, taking the shackles off alcohol, to, tobacco, and firearms in terms of computerizing its records so they can go after the scofflaw drug uh, gun dealers. Um, I'd want a uh, ballistic signature program so guns are fired first uh, so that anytime you find a bullet, you can figure out which gun it goes back to. Um, uh, and most important, I'd want to close the private sale loophole. So if I go to a gun dealer to buy a gun, he's got to run a background check to make sure I'm not a convicted felon or domestic violence perpetrator or uh, uh, somebody who's been uh, committed for mental disease. Um, but if you have a gun, you can sell it to me lawfully without ever finding out whether I can lawfully buy it. And something like 40% of the handguns sold in the U.S. are sold in private rather than uh, store transactions. That's the famous gun show loophole, which of course doesn't exist because there's nothing you can do at a gun show you can't do anywhere else. Right. Just the gun shows are where those transactions often take place. Um, it's easy to fix. All I have to say is if you want to sell your gun to me, we have to call a gun dealer and have him run a background check. And, you know, we pay him five bucks for it. I mean, there's, no, there's no rocket science about that. Um, so in return for that package, I'd be happy to give up shell issue and and national carry. Um, I can imagine selling a President Obama on that deal. Um, Despite his stated support in 1996 for uh, gun control along with well, abolishing I mean, the death penalty. And <laughs> right. I mean, there, there are people who are in favor of gun control because they think it will reduce homicide. And there are people who are in favor of gun control because they think guns are icky. 
and you know the part of the gun control movement is the the liberal version of the drug war right this is culture war right right we disapprove of those guys with the confederate flags on their trucks and since they like guns we're going to make guns hard to get cuz screw you um i don't get the sense that obama is in his heart a culture warrior um and that being the case um i think if he can be shown that that package i just mentioned will control crime better than the package we now have you might buy it and it's even possible to get through the congress I think that the problem is that um and you know as a pretty avid gun rights supporter myself I I actually like I've long been an advocate and gotten skewered for it by people on my own side of of that people should have to it should be like a driver's license that you should have to get you should have to prove that you know how to point and shoot the thing because um I have seen morons with guns you know on the first time on a firing range and frankly I don't want someone out who has not really internalized the message like you know know your target <laughs> don't point it at anything you don't intend to shoot always assume it's loaded etc I don't want those people out on the streets with a gun um until I, I they see, I see your, know how to I see your Darwinian convictions are just not very deep <laughs> Well unfortunately I'm worried about <laughs> what the what what Darwin might do to the, to me right. uh, with their gun um but that, you know, even as an, I, I might be able to sign on to that kind of package, but the problem is, and I think it's legitimate. It's it's just as with the on the on the other side of the abortion debate, right? Right. Um, a lot of a lot of the things about abortion aren't really like it's hard for me to get. I, I'm pro-choice, but it's hard for me to get really excited about parental notification. I just honestly like you know, except in the cases of where you've got a kid whose family will disown her or something, where there should be a judicial override. Um, it's hard for me to get excited about the notion that yeah, if I had been 15 and pregnant, I would have wanted to have an abortion without telling my parents because I wouldn't have wanted to confront my parents with it. Um, but I shouldn't have had an abortion without telling my parents uh, because my parents aren't psychotic freaks who would have turned me out of the house. There were people who could have provided me the kind of emotional support that I would have needed to get through that kind of very difficult time and help me make um, this decision, and, and maybe it's easy for me because my mother's a huge Planned Parenthood supporter or whatever. But, sure. um, but in general, I think like no. But you're su- you're assuming that there's a that there's a class of young women who will make the wrong choice, not be talked out of it by their provider, and presumably a competent abortion provider is going to say to a 15 year old, "Well, you know, can we help you talk to your parents about this?" Well, I think though that for a lot of kids, right, the decision to have an abortion is a decision not to tell your parents. Right. And that's not the reason that you should have an abortion, so that your parents won't find out. In almost all cases, if that is the case, then like you should talk to a judge, etc. And there should be a mechanism for getting beyond it. But the fact is, most kids don't want to tell their parents that they haven't they've been doing something they shouldn't have. Right. Um, in the same way that like I wouldn't allow, I wouldn't want kids to be doing extreme things to their bodies in order to avoid telling their parents that they'd been caught drinking. Right. Um, the 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 fact that you don't want to tell your parents is not a reason to have a fairly major procedure. That's you know, um, I think uh, not to talk about whether kids should fifteen year olds should have babies or anything. But I just think like not getting your parents involved in the process um, is not a reason for the state to recognize a right for you. The fact that you don't want your parents to know that you're having sex is not a, is not like a judicial right that the state should recognize. Um, you know, you you can't go out and get your belly button pierced without your parents knowing. You like, you, there's right. most things you can't do without your parents knowing for the good reason that we've decided you're not old enough to be in charge of your own life yet. Right. My um, view is that anybody who's not old enough to be in charge of his own life is not old enough to be in charge of a baby. So I'm I'm pretty absolute no, no, about no. negative reproductive freedom just because I don't want to deal with the kids. But uh, but my my main point on this is right that I think that most. Most pro-choice people, this is not actually things like a spousal notification law, parental notification law, um, the partial birth abortion ban. In and of themselves, they're not that big a deal. Um, and right, if there was a the feeling spot. that the parental notification, for example, was really something that like conservatives cared about in and of itself and wanted to stop there, mm-hmm. they would not fight it that hard. Right. I mean, they would probably still fight it, right. and I understand the reasons. I'm not saying there's no valid reasons to be... But it's just not something... But, in fact, what they feel completely legitimately is that this is, for pro-life forces, a way of just continually inching forward towards exactly. an outright ban. 
Exactly. No, um, I think I think the analogy you're drawing is exactly correct. In each case, there's a core interest that people want to defend. They see a slippery slope toward a complete abolition of that interest, and they're going to fight, you know, to keep the the outworks. Uh, so I actually hope the court finds a Second Amendment individual right to keep and bear arms. Take that one off the table. And right. I think it actually may, may make the the uh, gun control problem easier to solve. This is Eugene Bullock's claim, and I think he's probably probably right about that. Um, yes, if you made everybody get a get a license to have a gun, then you'd have, I think, concerns. You know, that when the NAFTA highway is driven by the New World Order to take the Trilateral Commission in charge of the country, they'll then have a list of all the gun owners they can go execute. Um, but it goes but back think, to this really I don't think we actually need that. War, I, I don't think, right? I think we need that. Like mm-hmm. if I lived in a pro life community, a pro choice community, I would be okay with the parental notification law. Right. Because what I would feel is that this is really a thing of like we're, we're trying to protect kids who might go and do something that they would later regret, whatever it is, have the baby, not have the baby, mm-hmm. because of some sort of family dynamic that is just a normal family dynamic of children. At least right. me, I was like hugely secretive and didn't want my parents to know anything I was doing, much less that I was doing something they disapproved of. Yeah. Um, but the fact is, because you live in a, a community that's partly pro-life, you, you know it's it's a battle against those people. Uh, and similarly right. with guns, it's it's a battle against. I mean, yeah. I think it's actually if I lived in a totally gu- supporting gun rights community, I would be totally okay with having a license to. Uh, to well, no, this is this is just for concealed carry, right? I'm not I'm yeah. not insisting on that for for ownership. I would I would actually institute a license to have a gun mm-hmm. in the same way that like if right. you're planning to operate a car. Right. You should. I think you should have to have a, a license to buy a car if you're gonna if you're gonna drive it. Like if you're gonna have a gun in your house, you should have to prove that you know how to shoot it and take right. the safety off and put it on and load it and unload right. it and all of those like basic. But that's what the license would consist of. It would consist of proving I am familiar with the operation of this piece of equipment. Right. I'm not gonna randomly kill someone because I'm just a well, And actually, you could, to. you could you could you could devolve that down to the gun dealer as well. So the gun dealer has to do a background check and has to certify that he's. Check the person out, right? But and then the, you don't the have then is, you don't have the list of gun owners. That's the thing is that I have a I have a I then have a legitimate fear that because there are people who want to ban guns, that the list is just going to create a list no. that they will then use right. to come and take all the guns away. That, well, and so partly the constitutional thing would would fix that, but partly if you devolve it down to the gun shop, right? Then there is no list, right? Uh, just just as you could do the. Uh, you know, Al Gore lost the presidency because he called for gun registration. Everything you want from gun, gun registration in terms of law enforcement, the ability to find out who last lawfully owned the gun that you found next to the corpse, you can get with gun tracing. And so you've you decentralized the records um, down to the gun shops. So well, I, think I, think there's, I think there is a politically viable compromise that gets you almost everything you want in terms of reducing homicide. From your lips to God's ears. Uh, maybe we could finish up with uh, something that you talked about, wanting to talk about, which is Robert Frank's luxury fever, which seems very appropriate this holiday season. As, uh, yes, indeed. As I'm bombarded with invitations to buy um, excessively expensive electronics, right, um, and other things to show off my wealth. Um, with, with, I mean, well, I'm so, glad you so, have wealth. Have some wealth now. I, mean. <laughs> I don't actually. I'm just. I'm. I'm invited to show off my putative wealth, which uh, sadly is mostly invested in my new sofa. Um, right. But uh, I'm saving it. You know, I'm putting it away for the grandchildren, so right. they'll have the sofa. Um, <laughs> but but we, we, uh, you you brought it up. So uh, so why don't you shoot on on, on luxury fever and? Right. Uh, so I think I think Frank makes four points all pointing in the same direction, which is that more wealth, that is is to say being able to satisfy more of your material preferences, doesn't, at a social level, make people happier. Um, If that's right, then lots of microeconomics and lots of microeconomic-based policy analysis, which is what I do for a living, Mm -hmm. sort of flies out the window. Um, But I think they're all pretty good points, right? So he starts with the Tibor Satoshi point, which you can actually find back in Xenophon, um, that people acclimate to levels of consumption uh, and therefore only enjoy themselves when they're consuming better than they usually consume. Uh, right. So in, in the in the hero, um, 
here the tyrant says to Simonides, the wise man, no, no, you're wrong to think that tyrants have the good life. Because what's the good life? Right? It's dressing up in your fancy clothes, having a feast, and having sexual access to people of superior social status. And if you're a tyrant, well, you never have a feast because that's your everyday meal. You never dress up in your fancy clothes because that's your working uniform. And there is no one of superior social status to have sexual access to. So it's really a boring life. Um, and then Satoshi, you know, uh, adds a lot of psychology and neurology to that. Um, but if that's right, if you take the, natu- the matching law seriously, then giving people unlimited resources to satisfy their preferences uh, won't, in fact, maximize their well-being because they're going to they're going to maintain too even a tenor of consumption. Right? Having an occasional feast is much better than eating a big meal every day. And you know, there were times when there were social and religious reasons to have a feast, um, but that's hard, or, 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 or not to eat a lot when you weren't having a feast. That's harder and harder to enforce. So I guess so I, think I would... A, yeah. I would have to challenge. I, I, I think there's a, uh, there's a there's a really good paper, and I forget his name. I just tried to Google it and couldn't find it. But it's, it's a paper called My Pain. Um, and it's written by uh, an MIT uh, economist who specializes actually in, in these sorts of behavioral economics questions. Um, and one of the things that he's tried to do is to – he's a burn victim. And so he's living – he's lived his entire life with um, disfiguring scars – pain from, lingering mm. pain from the scars, he has to manage all of these things, and his limited f- physical mobility and all these things. And he says, you know, look, I self-report at the very high end of happiness. Um, you know, like a lot of the data that Robert Frank uses relies on this, it's a, and, and it's really hard to see how you would get some other kind of data, but I self-report at the high end of happiness, but do I think I'm as happy as I would have been if I'd never been born, if I'd never been burned? No. Um, in fact, like I'm in pain and it hurts, but I just, I, I've I've given, I've taken, when I self-report, I'm taking that baseline and saying like, well, this is as good as I can get given that I have these burns. Um, you know, I'm really lucky that I have this awesome wife who married me despite my burns. I have all of these things that I have, even though my baseline is lower. So I self-report as as a high level of happiness, but it doesn't mean I'm actually as happy as I would have been. That when we're when we self well, think, think, think about how, we how hard that experiment is to do. Oh, I I, that, I agree. I mean, but I think certainly, that certainly, he knows that he would be happier if he woke up tomorrow morning without the scars and the pain, mm-hmm. and that's certainly true. He'd be delighted. He'd be euphoric for six months. And the question is, when he eventually went back to baseline, would it really be a higher baseline? Now, in that case, the answer is probably yes. Yes, I would. Um, I would say. Or think well, about let's I mean think about the the uh, a model that say Americans can understand of the dictator. Think about the most popular kid in high school or college. Um, so this guy gets all of these things, right? He he uh, his parents he's usually fairly wealthy. Um, his parents enable him to afford a high level of eating and drinking. He has sexual access to the highest status women on campus. Um, he has almost no responsibilities, and and uh, and he's looked up to by everyone. So he's got this enormously high status. Um, now, when he leaves college, we all you know we all at least fantasize that this is true. But I think like in many cases it actually is true that those people peak young. Right. Uh, my mother was talking about going to her high school reunion and finding out that all of the uh, these people had sort of ended up like working in the cafeteria, and that in fact they were kind of happy. Um, because they were the kind of people who were vague, fairly content with um, what my mother thinks of as fairly little. But at the same time, um, they're not as happy as they were in high school. Um, you know, they, they're conscious of the fact that they peaked. Right. Um, and Oh, and that's, and I think that's completely built into to the Stavsky model, right? That's, that's, his, that's his whole point, that every time you consume something you enjoy – you're raising your baseline and therefore making it harder to get enjoyment in the future. I mean, his, his account is that that pleasures, that is say things that, be, things that are positively valued when they're present, turn into comforts, things that are only negatively valued when they're absent. Um, 
And so, yeah, that's, that seems to, to support the story that says, you know, it really wasn't a favor to that kid uh, for him to be so successful in college because there's no place to go but down. And so one, one implication of this is it's useful to have a rising consumption bundle over time. Well, that's the Benjamin Friedman argument, right, is that people, if they don't have a rising consumption bundle, you, people can have a rising consumption bundle one of two ways. You can have a rising consumption bundle relative to your neighbors. In other words, you can be in a static economy mm-hmm. um, or even a, a shrinking economy, but as long as um, my relative position is changing, I'm better off. But you can also just have a rising consumption bundle relative um, to what you used to consume. Right. Um, and that is... As long as one of those two things is rising, you will actually become not only happier but nicer. Mm-hmm. You will do more of the things that we think about as moral, like um, mm-hmm. you'll, you'll give more to charity, you will be less racist, you will be right. nicer to your spouse or whatever. Um, and as long as those things are falling, as soon as those things start falling, um, you get into trouble. That, that, um, seems, that seems completely plausible, but, but it's true at any level, Right. So, on the one hand, not everybody can be taller than everybody else, except you. Um, so, that's a problem, right? Everybody will report being happier with more money. That's right. But if they're reporting that only because they have more money than someone else, then that's a zero-sum game. Um, and yes, you can have rising consumption bundles over a life course, but that's pretty independent of whether the whole economy is growing up. Well, but I think you have to challenge, first of all, I mean, assuming that, that it's actually there's some utility out of being taller, which I might dispute, it would be very utile for me if everyone else got taller because it would be easier for me to find clothes and, like, fit into airline seats. I, I've, I've toyed with the idea of moving to the Netherlands sh- solely for this reason because right. everything's big there. Well, there, there, there. There may be an important sex difference on this, on this dimension. But in general, um, you know, there is a benefit to men to being the tallest. Right. But there are also just benefits to being taller, right? There are you can get things off higher shelves, or you can. This goes against everything that I, I blogged today, where I blogged that there are actually ne- there are negative externalities right now to being tall. Um, the negative externalities. There are also. I mean, my, my sense is um, that if you know everybody were two inches shorter, uh, everybody'd be better off. I mean, the shelves would be the shelves would be would be shorter too. Um, but I can maximize my apartment space. Huh? In a way that I, I remember, like I, when I lived in Chicago, I my boyfriend at the time was only a couple inches shorter than me, but he came over and he couldn't get stuff. He was like five eleven versus my six two, but I had stuff on the top of cabinets he couldn't get. Right, that but, was well, clearly, saying, if everybody were shorter, the cabinets would be shorter, right? I and mean, that that seems to me doesn't go through. There's really no advantage to being larger unless there's sabre tigers around. No, it's a larger extra absolutely space. Huh? I mean, all of the all of the all of the the space between my floor. And the top of my cabinet was already used with shelves. Mm-hmm. This just added like an extra shelf that short people simply couldn't have. I suppose. Um, I suppose. So, yeah. so it actually did create. Look, utility. compared compared to the burden on the back and the knees and the heart. Yes, and my feet. I, no, I, I don't think there's any doubt that socially we'd all be better off shorter, but individually we're all better off taller. I mean, these the males are better off taller. Um, Women are better off shorter, sadly. Um, and. Um, but I think I think you know wealth is the same way. Um, so I mean, so Frank makes like, four sets of arguments. There's the the Xenophon Sadovsky argument that you get used to it, and therefore there's not much percentage in everybody getting richer. There's the Veblen argument that says you uh, you compare your consumption with other people, and therefore again there's no. It's better for me to be richer than you, but not for me to be richer absolutely. Um, there's Frank's, I think, original argument, which is it's not merely that you're comparing your consumption to other people's, you're comparing it to some social baseline. So insofar as you're, you're satisfied with having a good something, um, that status of goodness isn't absolute, it's relative to whatever else is out there. Um, and finally, and this is the important point, that not everything is consumed competitively so that there are some things where we could all get better off. We could all have a shorter commute. And we'd all be better off for having a shorter commute because I don't care make, compare my commute to yours. Um, we could all have better health care. Again, probably not competitively consumed. So Except for I plastic think, surgery. Hmm? 
Except for plastic surgery. Except for plastic surgery. Um, and yes, plastic surgery is the interesting counterexample there. But right. you know, I, so so I I will get back to this and, and argue that that um, I think it's hard to, for example, plastic surgery. I remember there was this show on on Fox News a couple of years ago, more maybe five or more years ago. It was called The Swan, and it's really horrifying. They take these women and they make them lose weight, and they um, and they give them plastic surgery and like dental implants and all this stuff. And you start watching it and you think this is just gross. I'm watching some sort of grotesque American circus. Right. Um, but here's the thing. Over time, they took women who were literally disfigured. I mean, there were women who, they took one woman who, like, when she was growing up, they called her the witch because her nose was so long and mm-hmm. spiky. Um, and another woman whose teeth had just all come in weird um, and were just sort of not an attractive color. And, and nothing that you would think in any of these cases, oh, the state-run healthcare system will take care of it, right? They weren't... Um, they didn't have a cleft palate or something, but they all had things that were, not all of them, but many of them had things that were severely wrong with their face. We're not talking mm-hmm. about, like, getting cheek implants. We're talking about fixing major things that made them pretty hideous. Right. Um, and at the end of it, you saw that, in fact, this plastic surgery had taken women who were at the very bottom end of the distribution and made them normal or even, you know, above normal. Um, and, ev- and so, yeah, in some sense, that's a competitive good, right? They're, they're, trun- they're just truncating a distribution. But in some other sense, like being able to truncate the distribution and move the bottom tail up, given that we're actually evolutionary, uh, evolutionarily evolutionarily hard, hardwired to enjoy beauty, not merely as a, a positional good, but also as a right. um, like an, an absolute standard. Well, look, I don't think there's any doubt that um, you know. I'm sorry, it's certainly plausible that you could reduce the absolute number of people in the population at whom other people look. At, Look and go uick, right? That, that you, I mean, one possibility is that the uick is simply the bottom five percent of the distribution, whatever it looks like. But I find what you're saying completely plausible. That that there may be an absolute rather than merely a positional good there. But but that's the analysis that Frank urges us to do. To understand that there's some things like bigger TV sets that we probably don't enjoy absolutely, uh, and other things that we do. And insofar as we can shift our econo- economic activity toward producing things that are absolutely enjoyed rather than positionally enjoyed, we'll get happier for the same amount of stuff. Now, that sort of wrecks most of what I know about economics, but it seems to me likely to be true, at least substantially true. I, I, I think that that, for me, um, it goes back to the fact that like it's very hard for me to establish, I think that as a, on a personal level, I actually think this is true. Right? The high I get from buying a new gadget is short-lived. And I buy too many gadgets because I enjoy the high. Um, that said, it's very hard for me to establish on any kind of macro level which of those gadgets is that for which people. I mean, if you're a huge sports nut, you may get like huge utility out of having this gigantic television right. that for me would be something shiny to hang in my living room that I would admire for two months. But for you, might really actually change really up your utility. And so that, I think, um, is but my... Th- that's is that's my something then we should encourage people to learn about themselves. Mm. I mean, the point is, the, the, the proposition that if you just let people maximize their current preference, they're going to do well may not be a very good approximation once we're as rich as we are now. And, and Frank actually provides some interesting examples. So um, he lived in a community where some people had spent a lot of money on a house with a nice view. And other people had spent the same sort of money on a Chagall for their living room. And he reported that the people with the view still were really into it five years later, and the people with the Chagall said, you know, it was great to have, and now it's wallpaper. I enjoy it when somebody else comes over and looks at it. Well, that's an important thing for people to know if they're going to spend important money on one of those two things. Right. Um, so I think he's pointing us toward a whole new set of inquiries and about away from a set of, of assumptions that are... Objects. Hmm? About objects? Ex- I, I think what it, it points to ultimately, right, is that when you when you buy an object, in the same way that when you buy a stock, you should be pricing the expected future cash flows... Right. In the in the in when you buy other objects that you should be uh, you should be trying to price the expected future utility flow, right? Um, 
and and that we need a better set of metrics for evaluating what things have high future utility flows. But right. and I, I'm not against that, but I am against the idea that that many people have put forward that therefore we should just tax the hell out of people with high incomes because they don't really enjoy them anyway, and we're preventing well, people from this positional race that makes them deeply unhappy. Well, I, I don't I don't think we would I don't think we would change the positional race much, um, but I do think it's 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 likely true that the universal belief among rich people that they'd be happier if the government would only stop taking money from them. It's probably false. Um, well, one thing I've learned about myself is that I tend to run on in blogging heads and then Robert Wright yells at me. So um, I think we have to wrap this up. But it's been great talking to you and uh, have a merry, non-luxury, feverish uh, holiday season. Uh, same to you, and I hope we can do it again. Yes, absolutely. Thanks, Take Peter. care. Take care. Bye.